Welcome to the Church on the Hill Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this week's message by Pastor Michael McReynolds. If you have any questions about the message or about the church or would like to know more about who we are, please feel free to contact our church office through the contact information located here on the website. Let him go. If you have your Bible, turn to Nehemiah chapter 2 or your iPhone or your Android or your Whatever it is that you use to access the scripture this morning, we're, we're continuing in our series. We're just working our way through the book of Nehemiah. And this morning, um, the title of our message is, actually Preston sang about it a lot this morning, and here it is. It's called Breaking Free from Condemnation. Breaking Free from Condemnation. And uh, we, we've been in this series. This is actually the seventh message, and there's a couple of more to go as we move through the end of the book. Uh, a few more to go, actually. So uh, if you would just keep reading that, uh, the book of Nehemiah is a great read, and you need to familiarize yourself with it uh, during the week. As so when we come back on Sundays, you kind of know where we are and, and know what's going on. And, and so as we continue this morning, uh, we want to remember that, that Nehemiah uh, has returned to Jerusalem. Preparations have begun uh, for the rebuilding uh, of the wall and the gates. The temple, if you remember, has been built now for 90 years. 90 years they have actually had the temple rebuilt, and yet the gates are burned with fire, the walls are down, and, and it's, a, it's a really a pretty, pretty tough situation there. So we're going to pick up our reading in chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 11 through 18, and then we'll move in this morning. I'm reading from the New King James, verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem, and there were three, and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And when I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and returned to the wall and viewed the wall, excuse me. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, or the officials, or the others who did the work. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Would you say that with me? Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hand to this good work. That is the word of the Lord. Let's lift our hands one more time to heaven. Father, thank you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your word. Father, give us ears to hear this morning what you want to say to us. Lord, let us just uh, find that help of Holy Spirit, Father, to become that that you've called us to be. Father, bless this time, we pray in your word, and it's in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. You know, this is a, an amazing book because it is literally, as we've learned, Nehemiah is a type of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. When, he, when you come to salvation, when you uh, receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit, there is a lot more going on than just the reception of something that gives you another language uh, or, or that uh, allows you to function in certain gifts, that God is really at work rebuilding the person that you were created initially to be. So that the Jews have returned to Jerusalem, like I just said, they've rebuilt the temple 90 years prior to Nehemiah's arrival, but they're not living in victory. Because of the condition of the walls and the gates, they are helpless against the relentless assault of the enemy. They literally lived in constant fear of their enemies just marauding, coming in, stealing, pillaging, uh, cowering in this place. Here it is, the temple's rebuilt, and yet they're not free to, to be who God's called them to be. 
And it speaks a, a lot of times people come to the Lord, we get saved, we accept Christ, but then there are still things in our lives that God is working on. Anybody found that to be true? Man, you know, when I got saved, I thought this is it, I'm done, it's all over, and I finally realized it took a while, that was just the beginning of the incredible process. Sanctification is instantaneous and progressive. That when you're first saved, truly born again, if you were to die right then and there, it's a given, right? His presence. However, if you're still breathing, then God is working on you. And God is changing you and He's, he's working on you. So, this is where often the enemy gains a foothold in so many believers' lives. We know we've encountered Jesus, but the crushing memory of our past can steal the joy of salvation from your life. That's the obstacle that we want to deal with this morning. It's condemnation. The enemy brings those things to our mind. Those, those uh, things come up, things surface, and all of a sudden people are under this incredible weight of, of condemnation. There's nothing so crippling in the life of a believer as condemnation. When you feel guilty, when you feel shame over what's been done, even though you know it's under the blood. How many know what I'm talking about? You know you've given it to Christ. You know you've repented. You know you've moved on. And then the enemy throws those things into your mind. They show up when you least expect them. And man, the weight of that sometimes is almost overwhelming. So, so what I want to talk about this morning is just that, breaking free. Uh, how many of you love the 23rd Psalm? Anybody love that passage of the Bible, uh, Bible passage? It's one of the most amazing, one of the, the most well-known uh, passages in Scripture. And it's from that little, that little psalm. It's a tender description of God's intent to restore and recover and rebuild everything in your life that's been broken down. Look at what David said. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. What we're talking about, and we have been in this series, is soul restoration. Is you coming to wholeness. Salvation, when you come to Christ, you know, heaven is a given. That's not all God intends to do in your life, is just get you to heaven. He wants you to come to wholeness. He wants you to come to victory, to live an overcoming life of faith. Jesus desires to lead you and I by the still life-giving waters of his presence, and he has given us the gift of the person of the Holy Spirit to bring that restoration of our soul about. That is the good news of this baptism, this, this person of the Holy Spirit. He's come to help restore you, to help rebuild you. He's, helped, he's come to free us from the shackles of guilt and condemnation and shame. And just as Nehemiah is now working to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit's at work in your life this morning. The very fact that you're here is an indication that something's going on. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, something's going on. In you, <laughs> something's really going on. It really is. A lot of times we're frustrated, and I'll get to that. We don't see progress. How many of you have felt that way in your Christian life? I'm saved, and, and I know that God's done a work in me, but I just don't see the progress. I used to believe that, that I had this misconception that I'd come to faith, and finally when I got from point A to point B, I would arrive, I would have it all together. Uh, it's been 39 years, I don't have it all together yet. But you know what God's interested in? The points in between. It's the process. It's the journey. He's working in my life, and he's working in your life this morning. So we've been talking about this process for a number of weeks, and we're studying an actual account of history. And it uses, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So here, here's the first point I want to get to this morning. We're talking about breaking condemnation. The very first thing I want you to get this morning is God's delays are not all Always denials. Anybody ever prayed for something and it took a while to come to pass? How many of you know God's delays are not always denials? In Nehemiah 2.11, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. I thought about this a lot this week. Nehemiah has arrived in Jerusalem and he gets there. He goes with such passion. He, he has risked his very life to speak to the king. He's traveled a thousand miles and when he gets there he takes three days off. And he takes three days. And he's basically inactive. No doubt it was a, a time of rest. A thousand miles on the back of a donkey would be quite a, quite a trip, right? I know that I've been traveling a lot lately, and uh, it, Southwest wears me out. You know, when I'm away from home for two days and get home, I am exhausted. So just imagine a thousand miles on the back of a donkey. 
I was in Guymon, Oklahoma this week, and if you've ever been to the Panhandle, you have to throw stuff out the window on the way up there so you have something to look at on the way home. <laughs> It's, it's the, there's just like a flat nothing forever. And uh, I, I was raised in the South where we have real trees. They don't have real trees out there. I mean, it, there's just no trees, right? West Texas, there's just sky, lots of sky. But think about this. If that wears me out, a thousand miles on the back of a donkey, three days, nothing has happened. Especially after there's been such an urgent plea made at the risk of his own life. And it makes me think about this. I, I thought about this. Have you ever wondered why God just can't get stuff done a little quicker? Anybody honest enough to say that? And, you know, come on, Lord. I mean, really? I mean, you know, uh, have you ever found yourself a little frustrated when things aren't moving along quite at the pace that you would like them to move along? Am I the only one that suffered with that? I know I'm not. It's called humanity, right? Where we, especially now, we have the internet active drive through culture where everything is I want it and I want it now and I want it my way. Okay, so God has a different plan, doesn't he? And, and I mean this. Sometimes we say this, you know, Lord, I've done everything right. I've been praying. I've been reading your word. I'm claiming the promises. And you know, you're just taking your sweet time. <laughs> Come on, sister. <laughs> talk back. You can talk back in this church. It's really okay. Uh, if you get out of hand, we'll have the ushers take you out. We, we're not scared of that. So over the years, I, I've learned this. I can do all that I know to do, and yet there's still times that after I've done all that I can do, I just have to stand still and wait to see the salvation of God. That his, his timetable is much different than mine. So can I say this to you this morning? God is never in a hurry. God is never in a hurry. His Holy Spirit is at work in us. And even when you can't tell, you've got to remember something. Fruit is grown. Gifts are given, but fruit grows. It grows to maturity through the process of time. Maturity does not happen in the natural nor in the spiritual overnight. It happens as a product of obedience and consistency and faith. Obedience, obedience, consistency, and faith. If things aren't happening for us the way we think they should, it does not mean that God has forgotten you. Here's the point made over again. God's denials or delays are not denials. We have to learn that, that we got to learn this because the enemy is going to press on us and the enemy is going to always come and press on you and say, well, the problem is you. If you would just get it together, this stuff would be happening. But that's not the problem, and that's not the case. You, if you listen to the voice of the enemy, that will lead you into the snare of condemnation. Well, if I was only better, if I was only smarter, if I only prayed more, if I only loved more, if I only did more. Folks, let me tell you something. God is at work. And the greatest place uh, that you can find yourself is at his feet, surrendered and waiting. He will speak and he will guide if you will get yourself there. Is that okay? Look at this. Our Father knows what He's doing, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a process, and it's a process that takes time. God is at work, and it's a process, and it takes time. God doesn't function on our timetable. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are higher than ours. He totally looks at this thing differently than we do. And I don't care how many books you buy at the Christian bookstore, God has a plan. And God is working in you. And the greatest thing that he wants you to do is enjoy the process. Enjoy the life that he's given you and the journey. There's a great book called The Artisan Soul by Erwin McManus. You ought to buy it and read it. It talks about how every one of our lives are a work of art. And great works of art often take time. Unless you're Jackson Pollock, anybody know who he is? Unless you're Jackson Pollock, he was the guy that just splattered paint on everything and, and they sell for millions of dollars. That probably didn't take a lot of time or thought. And that's me coming from my perspective, I, I guess. But, but some, most works of art take a long time to create. God's working in you. Here it is. The challenge for us is found in the waiting. And it's in the waiting that we learn to trust. It's in the waiting that you learn to say, Lord, I know you called me to do this. I know you've spoken. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be diligent. I'm just going to get up day in, day out, day in, day out, and I'm going to keep serving you. I'm going to keep following you. I'm going to keep living for you. Folks, the challenge is found in the waiting, and it's in the waiting that we learn to trust. 
Now, second point is this. This might rattle your theology, but how many of you believe this? God moves in the dark times. A lot of us want to want to confess that away and profess that away, but God moves in the dark times. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12. Then I arose in the night and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. I love this because all of Jerusalem is asleep and Nehemiah is surveying the destruction that has been brought on this city a century and a half before this time. The inhabitants are unaware, even the ones that are with them except for a few of them, uh, they're unaware and yet the one who God has sent to bring about the welfare, to bring about the reconstruction of this place is now in their midst and he's riding around. And he's there in the midst of them. Isn't it just like the Lord? Can I say this to you today? God is always mindful of you wherever you are. Whatever you're involved in, whatever you're doing, the Lord has not forgotten you. That he is aware of you. Uh, Listen, it it, it boggles my mind that 7.2 or 7.5 billion people on the planet, and yet we serve an omnipotent, omniscient God that is aware of every human life. That will over, it'll overload your hard drive if you really think about it. But that's the vastness and the greatness of our God. Look at this, Psalm 121, verse 1 through 4. The psalmist said, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now look, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep, slumber nor sleep. Our God is not asleep at the wheel. He is awake and very aware of you this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say this, hey, he's thinking about you. I've got scripture to back that up. See me afterwards, I'll tell you. He's thinking about you. More than the number of the sand of the sea, it says his thoughts are toward you. Psalms 139, God is thinking about you. Wow, that's amazing. Even when we're unaware, God's plan and purpose for our life is moving forward. Now, I want to just speak to you this morning. You might be in the midst of the darkest days of your life. You might have been through an incredible trial. You might be in the midst of one. But don't despair and do not give in to doubt or unbelief. The Holy Spirit is not idle this morning. He is very active. He's moving. And even in our darkest times when we're not aware of it. Even when we're totally unaware of it, God is moving. God, the scripture reveals to us numerous accounts where God is moving in the darkness, He's active in the darkness, and, and that's where the victory comes. Let me just give them to you real quick. Here it is. In the darkness and chaos of creation's beginning, the Holy Spirit's light births forth. Genesis 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form or void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Did you ever think about that? It's never stopped. When he said, let there be light, it began and it's never stopped. Uh, the, The universe is expanding. Some people call it the Big Bang. I call it the voice of God. He spoke and light has never stopped. Here's another one. In the darkness, Jacob wrestled with God. And what does he gain? He gains a new identity. It was in the midst of darkness. He wrestles with God, Genesis 32, 26. And he said, let me go, speaking to the angel of the Lord. For the day breaks, but he said, I will not unless let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. That means deceiver, supplanter. And he said, the angel speaking now, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and men and have prevailed. In the middle of your wrestling, in the middle of the night, God is aware. God is there and God will bring forth a new identity in your life through Christ if you will let him. Look at this one. Gideon's victory was in the middle watch of the night, midnight to 4 a.m., Judges 7, 19, so Gideon and a hundred men who were with them came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just as they had posted the watch, they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. In the middle of your darkest hour, God will bring forth light. Light comes forth. And then lastly, check this out. As the darkest, the dark temptation of the crucifixion overwhelmed the light of the day, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Hmm. Luke 23, 
Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. <laughs> then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Folks, it's in the midst of the darkest, darkest night that God is still aware. God is still moving. It was in the midst of that darkness that the veil was torn from top to bottom. What happened at that point? God got out on us. We didn't get into him. He got out on us. Yes, there's been a way made for salvation through the blood of the Lamb. It was at the darkest hour of crucifixion. Folks, the truth we can glean from this is this simple thing. God is moving even when we cannot see and do not understand what we're passing through. That's a confidence that you've got to have this morning. Whatever you're going through, you might not understand. You might not feel good about it. It might not look joyful at the moment. But if your faith is firmly anchored in in the living Christ, you can count on this. He is moving for your good. Amen. That he is working for your good. When we're tempted to give in, when we're tempted to give in, remember this. Dark times are intended to teach us to rest and trust. Dark times are intended to teach us to rest and to trust. It's in those moments that we don't need to be active. We need to be seated at his feet. Whatever's, I, I love that old saying, whatever's over your head is under the feet of Christ. Anything in life that's over your head, he's already overcome. Check it out. When darkness comes, you know what I think we need to do? Just lean back into his everlasting arms. Allow the Holy Spirit to work deep in your heart. The psalmist said, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You might be going through a tough time. Life doesn't always deal us the hand that we really want or expect, and yet God is faithful, and He is unmoved by our circumstance. He is absolutely faithful, and He is working, even in the dark times, even when you're fi you find yourself. Uh, you know, I'll be real honest. I'll be real vulnerable this morning. I think I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. I used to have a real hard time when people were depressed. I used to have a real hard time when people said, well, I'm just struggling with my emotions. I, I grew up in a family where the answer to everything was go to work. Well, stop, just quit it. Your mother would say, hey, stop acting like that. Quit pouting, just get to work. I, I grew up thinking you could just say, hey, pull up your socks, get back in the game, you're fine. Until I encountered real depression. Until I encountered that moment, that dark night of the soul where I just said, wow. And you know what? I didn't think I was going to make it. And yet what got me through was the faithfulness of the king that I serve. That every day I got up and did the same thing that I had always been doing before it ever started. I got up and read the word. And like I told you, I would get up, read the Bible and go, God, I know you're speaking. I have no idea what you're saying. But I'm going to keep being faithful. I'm going to keep pouring over the word. I'm going to keep worshiping you. And I'm going to keep going forward. I'm not going to quit. Can I tell you something? Jesus can bring light in the midst of every darkness. Our God is able to work in the midst of your valley. Okay? So here's point number three. Everybody with me? Yep. I feel like I'm going really fast today, and it might be because I'm going really fast today. You guys are being really quiet, which maybe this isn't a big shout and hallelujah kind of message. But I'll tell you what, every one of us in here deals with guilt and shame and condemnation. Unless maybe you've never sinned since you were saved. If that's you, would you raise your hand and stand up? We really want to see you. We've, I, don't, I haven't met that person yet. Right? Okay, so here's, here's some lessons from these gates. The valley gate. The lesson of the valley gate. So Nehemiah is riding around the city and he goes out through the valley gate. So here it is, Nehemiah 2, verse 13. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Now, it was, from the, it was from where the valley gate once stood that Nehemiah's survey crew left the city. But it's no coincidence that he chooses this path to begin this nighttime journey. And let me tell you why. Look at this. The valley gate derives its name from its access into the valley of Himnon. Himnon. I hope I'm saying that right. I was going to say it with Spanish vowels, and I know that's not right. So uh, it's the valley gate that leads to this. Now, the valley of Himnon is a deep, narrow ravine on the south end of the city of Jerusalem. It was by its very nature, it, it's where the idolatrous Israelites worshipped the pagan gods of Moloch and of Baal, and where the abominable practice of sacrificing their own children by burning them alive, that's where this took place. 
So after the return of the Jews from captivity, this valley was so abhorrent to them that they made it a place to throw all the refuse and the waste and even, even, even the carcasses of animal and human beings. Uh, criminals were executed in this place. This, this was a reprehensible place. It was a place that was so foul and so horrific that to keep the city from being defiled, they would burn uh, the trash. They would light fires there and they would burn day and night. And, and, and it's, it's, Jesus uses this knowledge of this place of the Valley of Hinnon as an analogy of the lake of fire. That, that this was such a reprehensible, smelly, awful place, uh, incorrigibly gross and wicked. It was, it was just a, an incredibly abominable place. And so why in the world would he start here? You see, in our study of Nehemiah, look at this. The valley gate represents the place where the worst of our past is revealed in all of its horror, and then it's dealt with once and for all. We're not going to be, we're not going to lie about it, but that's what the valley gate uh, represents. It represents the, the, the place where the worst of our past is revealed. It's exposed, but then it is dealt with once and for all. Right here this morning, that's what the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit wants to begin the reconstruction of our souls. He wants to give you something that you can say this morning, my past is dealt with, it is covered, it is done. I don't have to go there anymore. It's over with. We can accept the fact that once you have been redeemed, you are free. You've been made free. I believe, well, let me just quote uh, Mr. Hayford. Mr. Hayford said this about this passage. Stand at the doorway of your life and look over your past. Its future was eternal darkness and loss. Just as the valley gate secured the city from Himnom, We now see ourselves forgiven, secure in Christ, and the door to hell is closed before us once and for all. That ought to be a shout. You know, I I came into this thing uh, so free and so joyful. When I got saved, man, I was with these charismatics. They were crazy. We were wild for God. I mean, it was exciting. And then, you know what, through a process of time and my desire to be under mentorship, I got into this group of people that were just grumpy in Jesus. I don't know how to say it any any other way. They were so legalistic that every time, if you even thought about slipping up, you were on the way to hell. Even though you were saved, but everybody lived in the fear of going to hell, even after you were born again. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That I mean, there was such a, you know, I mean, if you said a cuss word, oh, man, you're going to hell. I mean, if you missed church, you were going to hell. Every time you turned around, they were trying to tell you you were going to hell. And I started becoming very uncomfortable with that. Because as I read the Bible, that's not what it says. What it says is I, have, I can find security, I can find confidence in the assurance that he has made the way for me back into the presence of God. And what Jack Hayford just said, he closed the door on hell and it's closed forever. That yeah. I'm not living in fear of that anymore. And you need not either. We need to begin to live in the confidence. Are you perfect? Heck no. Ask your spouse. You're not perfect. No. Listen, but guess what? God is working. God is moving. God is redeeming. God is transforming. Wow. Man, look at this. It's a place of perfect confidence. Why? Because he who the sun sets free is free indeed. It's a place of perfect confidence where we stand as the redeemed sons of God. We know that hell is real. We know there's a real devil. We can even sense sometimes the horrific smell and stench that are rising from it, but we are no longer threatened by it. And you need to start living that way, or you'll never enjoy the joy of who Jesus called you to be. I love to read the Puritans, but the Puritans never broke through into joy. Man, they were always so worried about doing it right and keeping the law and keeping the rules that they never, they never danced in the presence of Jesus. Jesus wants you free as a child to dance in the glory and the freedom of who he's called you and created you to be. Does that ring a bell? I hope so. Man, listen. 
The, the, the valley gate is a place of perfect confidence where we stand as redeemed sons and God. I love this. Look at this. There is a restored wall built on the foundation of the sacrificial lamb. And there is a rebuilt gate between our past life and our present, erected by the Holy Spirit's revelation of what Jesus has done for us. There is a gate that has been closed, and your feet are now standing on the firm foundation of what Jesus has done. And what Jesus has done, the devil can never undo. He can never undo. Man, the Holy Spirit is our Nehemiah. He desires to establish our lives with clear boundaries. And once Satan is thrown out, he cannot come back in, folks. He cannot come back in. All right, so check it out. Here's the serpent well. The serpent well. He talks about this. This is really interesting to me and did a lot of reading about it. After leaving the ruins of the city by night, uh, by the way of the valley gate, Nehemiah now passes through a place called the dragon or the serpent well. Now, a lot of different commentators have a lot of different opinions about this and, and some uh, about the, the reasons uh, for its naming. Some believe that it was the shape of the outlet uh, uh, that from which the water flowed, that of a dragon or a serpent. While the majority that I could read about found this, that uh, they said this, that they believed it was named as the result of someone who encountered encountered a poisonous snake while they journeyed to the well to drink water, and they killed it. You know how I feel about snakes, right? I hate snakes. I kill the good ones and then have remorse after it, uh, but I kill them first and then find out whether they're poisonous or not. I just don't like snakes. I never have. So I like that story the best. I choose to believe that's how it got its name because it just fits me. It fits me the way I read it. Okay, so you think about this. Just imagine you're, you're terribly thirsty. You've come to the well to drink, and you're met by that big rattlesnake. It's got to go. Yeah. A hoe, a shovel, or a 12-gauge. Depends on how, how, how close you want to get. Right? I told you the story before, but one year at camp, there was a guy who was a camp speaker. And I'm just going to be real honest. Can I be real honest with you? And the guy, you know, he was great at what he did, but he was just one of these kind of guys that I just thought, you know, this guy's a little too effeminate for me. Just something about him that bugs me. I'm sorry, I'm being real real with you, right? So we're there at camp, and he was a great minister, but I just, there was something about him that was kind of like creepy for me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I know I'm trying to get over that. So then we're out there by the, by the river, and they start yelling, snake, snake, snake. And we go down there, and there's about a five and a half foot female rattlesnake that was about that big around. And we were like, whew, I'm thinking, I don't have a gun and I don't have a shovel. This guy walked down there, stepped down into this little low depression in the ground, and grabbed that sucker by the tail, pulled him out, and grabbed him by the neck. And I nearly fainted. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Then he says, well, I'm an EMT and I live in Phoenix and we get snake calls all the time. I do this all the time. I said, well, dude, you just, you just uh, went up about 45 notches in my opinion of you, so I'm not messing with you. <laughs> he might talk a little funny, but he, boy, that guy had some backbone. He was not scared of that snake. Can I tell you, folks, this, <laughs> that's a crazy story. To, how do I segue back into what I'm trying to talk to you about? Look. I thought about this a lot, and I thought, how many times when you are pressing in to the fullness of Jesus, does the enemy send something to deter and to distract you? Okay, Jesus said this. Jesus said, whosoever drinks of this water that I give him will never thirst, but the water will become a fountain springing up into everlasting life. The serpent always comes in an attempt to cut your access off to that joy. The serpent always comes to try to distract you. He tries to deal with you. But can I tell you, we have an elder brother who has cut the serpent's head from his body. That that serpent has been dealt with. It was dealt with on the cross. And we need to understand that. Our God is calling us to drink deeply of his presence and this endless well of joyful salvation. The enemy will come, but Christ has conquered he is Christus, victory is conquered. Look at this, Isaiah 12. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for Yah. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's also become my salvation. Therefore, 
with joy. You will draw waters from the well of salvation. Joyful, joyful drawing of water. Folks, the valley gate leads us to the serpent well, and it's there that we see the Holy Spirit. Let me try to sum this up for you. It's right there that we see the Holy Spirit leading us to two things that I want you to get. Number one is this, a place of security with your salvation. It's a place of security. Was that in there, Nancy? There you go. Following Nehemiah through the valley gate to the serpent's well, you can begin to see where the Holy Spirit is leading us to a place of security in our salvation because our past has been dealt with at the cross. Romans 6, Paul tells us the body of sin was crucified with him at Calvary. The body of sin. He tells us very plainly in that chapter that whoever you submit yourself to, you'll be the servant of. He, you can walk in the victory and the freedom. You don't have to go back to the old haunts and the old places of your past. Christ, by his cross, has cut the head from the serpent. Look at this. The second thing, the place, uh, this, the, the serpent's well is a place of victory over condemnation and the, uh, the devil's efforts to steal the joy of our new life in Christ. You and I now can have a steadfast confidence in our relationship with God. We can be secure about our future. What Nehemiah came to do for the inhabitants of Jerusalem is what the Holy Spirit has come to do for you. He's come to make these truths help you make them your own. Man, I, you know, I love listening to preaching. I love uh, listening to great singers, and I, and I love reading great books. But the things that keep me going, the things that have kept me through that time of depression, the, the things that get me up every day is my personal connection with a God that speaks to me deliberately, intentionally, personally to me every day. And those truths become so well established that when they do, you can face anything. You can go through anything. Everybody still with me? Yes. Listen, folks, look at this. I, I thought about this. If God's grace is sufficient to cover our past sins, if God's grace, if God's power is, is capable of shutting the door of hell's access to my life, then I surely believe he's capable of handling my future. Amen. What do you think? I'm pretty confident that I can get from here to tomorrow because my God stands with me and he stands with you. Man, listen, folks, when the enemy tries to come in and tell you you're worthless, when he tries to come in and tell you you failed again, you just need to remind him of his future. When he tells you about your past, tell him about his future. You need to become aggressive. And that's going to be my last point. I'm just going to give you some scriptural bullets that really have helped me. So here's my last point today. It's breaking free from condemnation. Do you really, are you really ready to be free? Thank you for that amen. That was a question. Are you ready to be free? Yes. Uh, look, we live kind of numb in this culture of media. We're just like overwhelmed with all this stimuli. The point is, is he real to you? Is your relationship with Jesus fresh and vibrant? And is it exciting? I mean, when you open the Word of God, does it really excite you? Or are you still stuck in those first chapters of First Chronicles? And you're going, what in the world is all that all about? Keep going, keep digging, keep reading. God's life will come. The excitement and the joyful presence of his grace, it will be found by you. So here it is, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, so very familiar. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now most modern translations stop right there, but I love the King James and the New King James, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I have found that when, since I've been saved, if I give in to my flesh and walk after my flesh, condemnation is a reality. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Why? But for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. One of the most debilitating and effective weapons of the enemy against our soul and against the bride of Christ is condemnation. And let me tell you what it is. It's a self-inflicted wound. The enemy comes and he just tempts you and reminds you of what was and we're usually the one that does the damage. Condemnation is a self-inflicted wound and it rises out of your own shame and your own guilt. 
I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been praying, I've been in worship, I'm having a wonderful moment with God, and all of a sudden a fiery dart of a thought from my past flies in, and he reminds me of something I did or something I was involved in, and I just have to go, man, I haven't thought about that in years. And then I say, but I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm going to take authority over it and cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring my thinking into obedience of Christ. That's a willful decision. That's an act of your will. Casey was talking about it this morning. Those are the things we kind of sit back in the easy chair with the remote and hope that God zaps us with the Holy Ghost. Folks, you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to get into his presence intentionally pursuing him, seeking him, disciplining yourself, and then you'll have the weapon to fight with. Because if you don't, you won't. Man, one of the most debilitating weapons is condemnation. But I love this because after recording that great struggle in Romans 7, Paul comes to this conclusion at the beginning of chapter 8, and he states unequivocally that if we are in Christ, if we are walking in the Spirit, there is therefore now no condemnation. That when God looks at you, He does not look at you with any condemnation at all. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, we can stand in the fact and the knowledge that He who the Son sets free is free indeed. You're free. If you're set free in Jesus, you're free. You don't have to go back and pick anything of your old life up. Now, we know that in our heads. We know that in our heads. But if we're to break three within our hearts, then you're going to have to build a solid foundation of a knowledge of the Word of God with which to speak and fight against it. Because your thought life, your, that stuff is still going to come. The enemy is going to try to defeat you. I've told you before I had a friend when I was first saved. He was crazy. He was, he was on fire for, with God, for God, but he was crazy. We would be driving down the road, he would be driving, and all of a sudden he would act like he was grabbing something from his head, and he would go, ah, and he would yell, and he would throw it like that. And I, and I would just say, what's wrong? He goes, I'm casting down wicked imaginations. I'm doing something physical because when I do that, it helps me know that I don't have to be subject to what I'm thinking. And you might say, now that's weird. If you do that at work tomorrow, people are going to really think you're strange. So do it quietly. Kind of go, mm, yeah, yeah, I got it. Whatever you do, do something uh, to get you to where you start thinking differently. And then be aggressive. And so it's the foundation of the, of the Word of God. So I just want to give you three scriptures that I think will really help you. If you'll, if you'll learn them, if you'll memorize them. So it speaks to where what God has done with our sins. Psalms 103, verse 11 and 12. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I'm not real smart, but if you fly, if you fly east long enough and you have enough fuel, you'll end up coming out of the west. We like to think of heaven is up and hell is down. How does that work out for the Australians? Just think about it. I, I don't know. That's, a, you know, for them, down, our down is their up. So our summer is their winter. I don't know. But think about this. Your sins are as far from you as the east is from the west. It never meets. It never meets. The mercies of God. Look at this, Micah chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgressions of the remnant of his heritage, who does not retain his anger forever? Why? Because he delights in mercy. Our God delights in mercy. Our God is delighted to be merciful to us. He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Man, that is exciting, folks. He delights in mercy. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. There's a terrible tendency in, in, in the body of Christ to think something is righteous or pious when we're judgmental. I, I was in this camp that, that the more judgmental it seemed they were, the more pious they thought they were. And that, that's the, exact, that's the antith antithesis of Scripture. God delights in mercy. God delights in showing compassion and mercy. Yes. Somebody ought to say, I'm glad about that. Man, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be here today if that were not true. 
that God delights in mercy. He has compassion on us. He subdues our iniquity. You know what that speaks to me of? Where's the wrestling fan in the room? Man, that's the big throwdown there. That's the takedown. He subdues the mercy. And if you want to know anything about wrestling, ask JR. See, subdues. He literally tackles the iniquity and subdues it, puts it down forever. He casts our sins into the depths of the sea. Stop fishing, folks. <laughs> Don't go fishing for it. And then lastly, look at this. This is really uh, the writer of Hebrews is quoting from the book of Jeremiah here. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart and into their minds, and I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Man, when Jesus looks at us this morning, we're justified. You know what that means? When he looks at you, it, you look just as if you had never sinned. When he looks at you, he sees you through the beauty and the perfection of his son. When he looks at you this morning, he does not see, he doesn't remember what you've done. He doesn't, he's not keeping score. Now the devil is, I believe we'll stand before the throne of God and the devil will be there and he'll bring it all up again. And that's when Jesus will squash him once and for all. And he'll say, yeah, but you know what? He has an advocate and I'm the advocate. Let me tell you, folks, God has mercy in abundance. And then let me tell you something that I, I thought about this. He forgets our sins. He remembers them no more. Look at this. It's not a case of senile forgetfulness. It's a case of divine eradication. I tell people all the time, look, I'm getting a little older. I will not lie to you, but I might forget. <laughs> So just give me some grace, right? I won't lie to you. But if I don't do something that I tell you I'm going to do, remind me. It will be helpful. Just remind me. God's, this, is not, uh, this is not God having senile forgetfulness. This is divine eradication. In other words, because the sinless record and the righteousness of Jesus Christ has now been applied to you, there is nothing in him, there's not a single thing about you that displeases God this morning. That when he looks on you, he looks on you through the blood of Christ. You're justified just as if you had never seen, sinned, never sinned. Come on, Preston, come on and get ready. You know what I thought about? I thought about the superimposition of Jesus' life over my life. That now the blood of the Son has literally washed me and made me clean. That when God looks upon me, he no longer sees me what I was. He sees me who I am in his Son. He sees me completely complete, completely made whole. And, and I just believe, folks that you can have a confidence for life, that you can live. This is the confidence that you've been called to live in this morning, regardless of your past, regardless of what you've been through, regardless of what's been done to you. And a lot of times we've lived our lives and things were done to us and we were, we were the unfortunate recipients of something collateral because of someone else's failure. Someone else's sin and depravity leaked over into our lives and it brought woundedness and hurt. But I've got great news for you. God can heal that too. That you don't have to carry that another day. Whatever you've done, put it under the blood this morning. Hear my heart this morning. The gate has been raised and hell has been locked out forever. The gate has been raised. The serpent has been slain and you can freely access the waters of salvation without fear. You don't have to be afraid anymore. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now none. The water of life is flowing freely and all you've got to do is drink. The water of life is flowing freely, but you've got to make a decision. You've got to decide, do you want to live above where you've been living? It's time for us to rebuild the valley gate in our own hearts. It's time for us to shut the door on hell once and for all. It's time for us to make a decision that we will no longer be tormented by our thought life. We will no longer be tormented by what we've done, but we can close that chapter. Listen to me. God is always moving us forward. God is always looking forward. He's not looking back. People that look back and that text while they're driving scare me to death. You know, their eyes are not on the road. Let me tell you, God is looking for your future. You need to stand this morning and say, you know what, I'm going to accept what he's already done. Could you do that? Would you stand up with me this morning? 
I just really want them to kind of kind of take us. This is a miracle, y'all. It's like 25 to 12. It's a miracle. Y'all don't even see it. Miracles do happen. Can I tell you something, folks? I really, it's time to live free. It's time to be free. It's time, it's time to begin to walk in the confidence of a son of God. That you're called out of darkness into his marvelous light that you should show forth the praises of him. God has given you new life. And it's time for us to begin to lay hold of that life. Let me tell you why. There's a world out there that needs what you have. There's a world out there that needs to hear and know what you hear and what you know. There's people all around you. Uh, Chris preached it. I love it. When you have a, a co-pastor who's an evangelist and he takes up the offering, you can always count on him to preach, right? He's going to do it every time. He, you can't stop him. They're going to the park tonight. You need to pray for them. They're, doing, they're starting their outreach back up again. And so that's in him, and it's so much in him that I love it. He'll go down to the south side of town, and if you're going to go, uh, bless you. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be hot. It's going to be incredible. Here's the good news. There is therefore now no condemnation. But we have a choice. Let's just lift our hands. Let's just press into his presence. Lord, Father, you are our Father. My God and my King. You've made a way this morning where there was no way. Lord, you have opened the door of salvation and life. You're longing this morning to lead us beside the still water. You're longing this morning to restore our soul, and you've sent our Nehemiah, the Holy Spirit, to accomplish that. So Father, right now in this house, I would just ask that as you come, that you would just, you would just hover, that you would just deal with hearts this morning. That you, Lord Jesus, would do something deep within each and every one of us. That whoever's here this morning that struggled, maybe they've, maybe they've even failed this week, maybe they've blown it big time, that Lord, they would recognize there is therefore now no condemnation, that if we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9, that you, you are the God that, that longs, that, that delights in mercy, that your heart is towards us, your heart is not far from us, your heart is yearning for us this morning. Lord God, we long for that embrace. Lord, we ask you this morning just to overwhelm us with that goodness. That lay between just overwhelm us with that goodness, Lord. The mountain I could not climb. Let's just worship for a few moments. In desperation, if you need prayer for anything at all this morning, this altar is open. There are some prayer teams around. And if you need prayer, just come. We want to pray with you. Let's just worship. This is such a great song to sing. And through the dark. 